Hello. Hi there. It's Rachel Bell. And producer Laura and I are taking this week to work on new episodes. But I didn't want to leave you hanging. So I polished up one of my very favorite episodes for your listening pleasure. William Shatner is one of the funniest people I've had on your last meal. And this wasn't a classic one-sided interview where I ask him questions and he answers. This was a ridiculous off-the-rails conversation. And even if you listen to this one when it came out back in May of 2019, I highly recommend listening again. If not for entertainment, then as a reminder that you too can be this sharp and this silly at 90 years old. So enjoy William Shatner, and we'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode featuring comedian and Bob's Burger star, Eugene Merman. All right, let's start the show. Cairo, Seattle. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal, a show about famous people and the stories behind the foods they love most. Today on the program, actor, author, spoken word singer, horse breeder, paintball enthusiast, William Shatner. Shatner is best known for playing Captain Kirk on Star Trek. Well, before we talk about food, I want to go back to the late 1960s for that first interracial kiss between... Oh, please, you don't want to do that. You guys are in for a treat. I've never said this about a grown man before, but William Shatner is sassy. He is funny, he is sharp, and he has played so many parts in his 88 years that my finger is tired from scrolling down his IMDb. And he's still coming up with ideas for shows. He's hoping to pitch a show called MILF. Moms, I'd like to feed. Uh, Women who uh, get pregnant get weird about their food. So maybe that is something that we would uh, address. There is, of course, a cliche that women crave all kinds of strange things when they're pregnant. But research done by psychology professor Dr. Julia Hormis shows that the whole pickles and ice cream thing is actually a myth. It's a fascinating interview about the science and cultural influence of cravings. And have you ever had Mexican sushi before? Have you ever heard of Mexican sushi? It is a specialty of Sinaloa, Mexico, and it's actually pretty hard to track down in the United States. There is one Mexican sushi restaurant in Washington State, and I took a field trip to Sushi Nola in Kent, Washington. Inside there's chicken, shrimp, carne asada, and then you got also cream cheese. We use a lot of cream cheese and avocado. All of this is coming up. But first, my interview with the weird and wonderful William Shatner. Morning. Good morning, William Shatner. How are you? Pretty good. How's the quality of sound? Not a speakerphone, but just easier that way. It would sound much better if it wasn't on speaker, though, and we're always going for that. Well, then here you are. Oh, yes, that is much better. Like a little chocolate in my ear, which I've never said before, and I hope I never say that again. That was weird. (laughs) A little chocolate? Is that what you said? Yeah, well, like a little chocolate sound in my ear. I had had an avocado toast uh, the other day that was so much more tasty than others that I have had due to the fact they had a sprinkle of honey uh, like layered through it. So the honey and the and the guacamole, which is a weird combination, really, it was just a touch of chocolate in the night. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to say it had chocolate on it, and I was like, where did you get this? I would no, like to but, go there, but too. But I've been looking at mole with some interest. Me, too. I was just having this conversation last night that I want to try it, and I think... With whom? With my boyfriend, if you must know, you jealous man. Yes, and where were you when you were having this conversation? I was sitting on my couch, and we were eating a dish. And where was he? He was sitting next to me. How close? I would say about six to eight inches. That's not quite... You're breaking the bubble there, you know. Really? Too close or yeah. too far? No, a little further. 18 inches is about the, so, the limit that two people can, uh, without intruding on each other's space, unless you want to. Well, I thought that was just 18 inches for planting tomatoes. I didn't think that was for planting humans next to each other. No, no, 18 inches for mole, no question about it. (laughs) I love that you're eating avocado toast, America's most trendy uh, toast of the moment. Is it really? I've been at it for years now at a particular restaurant that I don't need to mention, but uh, they're they're known for their... uh, it, because the the avocado toast depends a lot on the toast. What kind of toast do you like? Well, it, but that's it. You see, they make their bread at this restaurant, and it's toasted to a particular crispness. It, it, but it, it can't be too crisp 
because then it breaks. But it can't be too mealy because then it just bends. So somewhere in between is the ultimate toast with the avocado with a, just a, a hint of heat from some peppers, maybe. And then with the toast, you can't have it too toasty because then all of a sudden you've destroyed the roof of your mouth. Well, that's it. Mm-hmm. The, the quality of the toast, it, to me, is just as important as the quality of the avocado. William Shatner, toastologist. Yes. Avocado toast has been hashtagged more than 1,200,000 times on Instagram. It's delicious, it's trendy, it's everywhere, and it's controversial. In 2017, on Australia's version of 60 Minutes, an Australian millionaire went viral for saying that millennials can't afford to buy homes because they waste all their money eating expensive avocado toast at brunch. And no one seems to be able to agree on who invented it. But as far as the Instagrammable avocado toast served in trendy cafes today, that prize just might go to Australia. Mari Uyahara wrote a big piece for Taste on tastecooking.com. And she says an all-day cafe in Sydney called Bill's is where it all started. So according to the article, in 1993, the owner, Bill Granger, was a 22-year-old with no cooking experience who needed to come up with a healthful breakfast menu that athletic, body-conscious, bikini-clad Aussies would actually want to eat. So he laid out slices of avocado over sourdough toast. He added a squeeze of lime, a drizzle of olive oil, and a fistful of cilantro leaves. And that simple dish became an instant success. But in the end, it was neither the United States or Australia who really invented the concept of putting creamy avocado on bread. Avocados are from Mexico, and tortillas are a form of bread. Taste says the Aztecs thought of avocados as a fertility fruit. So the Spanish word for avocado is ahuacate, which is derived from the Aztec word for testicle. They think this may be the case because avocados grow in pairs on trees. I am loving this fact. And they were known as aguacates until 1915, which is when the California Avocado Association renamed them avocados. When we come back, William Shatner reveals his last meal. And in the third act of the show, I read that uh, you were conceptualizing a show called MILF. That's right. (laughs) <laughs> what would that show be about? Shatner reveals all when we return. Ta-da. Welcome back to Your Last Meal. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you do that wherever you're listening so you never miss an episode. And follow along on Instagram. Hello, Rachel Bell. B-E-L-L-E. All right, back to the show. The time has come to find out what William Shatner wants for his last meal. That uh, avocado thing sounded really good. I uh, am a real sushi aficionado. I really love the simplicity and yet the complexity of Japanese uh, cuisine. On the other hand, Mexican uh, cuisine is taking uh, its rightful uh, stage uh, in the world and... A great Mexican, we were talking mole and avocado and rice and beans. And I mean, a a sophisticated Mexican cuisine is really good and healthy. What's your favorite dish right now? I'm going to go, I haven't had breakfast. And I'm thinking, where do I want to go for lunch? I'm thinking Mexican, but sophisticated Mexican. Mexican with with an expert's touch. And since I don't know too much about mole... I might like to try a little chocolate in the night. (laughs) Everything's coming full circle for us. I know. Full circle is where it's at, my dear. William Shatner wants sushi and Mexican food for his last meal. But we already did a mole episode. Mole Poblano was Oscar-winning director Guillermo del Toro's last meal. He directed The Shape of Water and Pan's Labyrinth, and you can go back and listen to that episode. But when Mr. Shatner mentioned sushi and Mexican food, I immediately thought of Mexican sushi. Now, I have known about Mexican sushi for approximately, I don't know, a month. I read an article in Eater that was written by my friend Naomi Tomke about a Mexican sushi restaurant in Kent, Washington called Sushi Nola. 
and I learned that Mexican sushi is a very, very rare thing in the United States. The sushi is made with rice and seaweed, like you might expect, but that is where the similarity to Japanese sushi ends. These rolls are stuffed with carne asada, imitation crab, fried shrimp, all in one roll, and cream cheese is a starring ingredient in every roll. I drove down to Kent to chat with Ana Yancy Reyes, who co-owns Sushi Nola with her mom and sister. We're from Sinaloa, and the sushi started like around on the 2000s. We don't really call it over there Mexican sushi. We call it more like Sinaloense sushi because it's more like in the part of um, Sinaloa. There's other parts of Mexico where they don't really know the sushi. How did it come to Sinaloa? So I guess this um, Asian guy came. He was making sushi there, but he was making, like, you know, Japanese sushi. And then there was this guy. He's like, oh, I want some carne asada on my sushi. So they started putting carne asada, and they started adding more stuff to it. And then over there, we don't really eat, like, raw stuff. We pretty much eat everything, like, fried and cooked. Yep. Nothing is raw. And to really make their point, the entire roll filled with cooked ingredients is then rolled in tempura crunchies and deep fried. The thing with Mexicans, when they think of a sushi, they think of a raw sushi, like raw. And me, I don't need raw either. So they would be like, oh, no sushi, I don't need sushi. And I would be just try it, you know. And now I have friends that they love it. Oh, this is so different. You know, everything is cooked and more because of the cream cheese. The rolls are big. They're cut into about 10 pieces and topped with zigzags of homemade chipotle sauce, sweet eel sauce or pico de gallo. And a few rolls are covered in melted cheese. Oh, yeah. That one, the quesitos roll. Oh, inside, it got spicy tampico. It got avocado and it got cream cheese. And on top, we put like grilled cheese. So there's just a bunch of melted cheese on the top yes. of the rolls? Uh, yeah. It's this one right here. What kind of cheese? Uh, we use pepper jack cheese. And what does it come with on the side? Put carrots on the side, and then the chile guarito is like this pepper, but it's not too spicy. You will grab like a bite of the sushi and then a bite of the chile. So that one's like filled with cheese and topped with cheese. So is it just kind of like melty, oozy, squishy in your mouth? Yeah. The other one that um, we have it out is the jalapeno roll. That one's pretty good. Inside... Um, we got shrimp, steak, avocado, cream cheese. And then outside, we get more cream cheese, uh, Monterey Jack cheese, bacon, and jalapeno. So you can eat with chopsticks, but my plate of sushi came with a fork, which Anayansi said is how most people in Sinaloa eat their sushi. And I had the Cielo, Mar y Tierra roll, which translates to sky, sea, and earth. So you have the chicken, which represents the sky. You have the imitation crab and the cooked shrimp, which represents the sea, and the carne asada, which represents the earth. Oh, and of course, the fourth earthly element, cream cheese. Cream cheese is everywhere. And if you ask for it, you can get the special soy dipping sauce. When you go to like the um, Japanese restaurants, they all have like soy sauce, but it's too salty. So we made a new one and we use soy sauce. We put lime in it and also orange juice. It tastes really good. It is really good. The zingy lime and the slight sweetness from the orange juice really does mellow out the salty soy sauce. And the lime is almost necessary because you're trying to cut through cream cheese and meat and a deep fried crust. It actually is perfect. And I kind of want to add lime to my soy sauce from now on. But if you're looking for ginger and wasabi, you're not going to find it here. Instead, there are at least six different kinds of Mexican hot sauce on every table. Although Anayansi says Mexicans don't traditionally use hot sauce on their sushi rolls. It's there for the rest of the seafood-focused menu. They also serve fish tacos and ceviches, aguachiles, and several fish dishes native to the Sinaloan region, which is on the west coast of Mexico, across the Gulf of California from Baja. Anayansi says most of the recipes are her mom's. We moved here like on 2017. We moved here in 2007, my mom, my sister, and I. We were also always like working on restaurants, but my mom, she's like a really good cooker. Like anything she does, it's really good. That was like always our dream, more of her, you know, having a restaurant. 
Anayansi's mom and sister started by selling Mexican sushi through Facebook Marketplace. And eventually they opened their restaurant in a Kent strip mall about a year and a half ago. So when someone comes in here and they are from Sinaloa and they finally just found you, what is their reaction when they come in? Oh no, we have have people that they're like, thank you so much for you guys to be here because we're so far away from home and you guys make it feel like we're at home. Yeah, oh yeah, they always get excited about it. Okay, so I tried one of the rolls and I was surprised that it actually tasted like sushi because it's full of all of these Mexican ingredients. I mean, it doesn't taste like raw fish, obviously, or traditional Japanese sushi, but because of the rice and the seaweed and maybe because of the tempura crumbs, it tastes more like sushi than it tastes like Mexican food. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back more with William Shatner. Who knows what he'll say next? Nobody knows! At 88 years old, William Shatner's career is still alive and well. You have a never-ending list of projects that you're working on. It's like you're always coming out with a new album and a new show and you're pitching something. Do you get tired of people asking you, when are you going to retire? Or, wow, look what you're doing at your age. Is that annoying to you? Yeah, both of those things are uh, are an anathema to me. So don't even, we're not even going to go there. Good. I read that uh, you were conceptualizing a show called MILF, Mothers I'd Like to Feed. That's right. (laughs) What would that show be about? (laughs) Well, I, I, it's um, I, 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 I'm about to say something that you, it doesn't wouldn't look good, wouldn't look good in print. Perfect. Um, uh, yes, mothers I'd like to feed is uh, the title of a uh, cooking show that we're kind of organizing and trying to sell. I've gotten both positive and negative reaction. What would it be about? What do you mean? What would it be about? You'd cook something, and uh, a mother. Uh, would uh, eat it and uh, enjoy it. Okay, whether she likes it or not. Well, I mean, if she was lactating, we'd get her. We'd be we'd feed her something uh, else. Well, I'll tell you, I have a uh, a dog right now. Uh, I have two Dobermans at home. One is a female, and she's in heat, and I mean, really in heat today, tomorrow, uh, and I don't want her bred. We've got a male dog uh, at the house as well, uh, so she's gotten weird about her food and i guess uh women who uh get pregnant get weird about their food so maybe that is something that we would uh address in uh m-i-l-f well if i may suggest a spin-off show milf mutts i'd like to feed all about pregnant and in heat dogs <laughs> i'm available to work on the show with you very free <laughs> Uh, well, you're, you're available to work. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, we'll 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 work something out. Okay. Perfect. All right. There's a lot to sift through in what you just heard, but what I'm going to focus on is pregnant women have wacky cravings, which is a story that's completely embedded into American culture. When I have a friend who gets pregnant, one of the first things I ask them is. What cravings are you having? What have you been wanting to eat since you got pregnant? But Dr. Julia Hormis, professor of psychology at the Albany State University of New York, published a study about cravings, specifically looking at pregnant women. And the findings are fascinating. I think that it's such a cliche. Pregnant women have crazy cravings, you know, like pickles come up a lot and strange combinations of food like pickles and ice cream and peanut butter. So what have you found in your research? Pregnancy cravings are real. The majority of American pregnant women report food cravings. Um, They just tend to not be caused necessarily by anything that's happening in the body during pregnancy. It's more psychological and actually cultural factors. And then you mentioned that pregnant women crave crazy combinations of things. We have not found that to be the case in our research. The pickles and ice cream actually is pretty rare. Um, Turns out that pregnant women in the U.S. tend to crave the same things when they're pregnant that they tend to crave when they're not pregnant. And that tends to be the pizza, ice cream, french fries, cookies, chocolate, candy, (laughs) those types of foods. Not necessarily the crazy combinations. We don't find much evidence for that. Dr. Hormis says cravings are actually a very American thing. To crave something, pregnant or not, is not universal. So cravings tend to be more common in women than men, at least in the U.S., 
and they also tend to coincide with particular times during uh, a woman's life, um, in particular pregnancy, which you obviously mentioned, and then also menstruation is often cited as a big trigger for cravings. And so because of that, people kind of focused on the obvious explanations, right? It must be something related to hormones. Um, maybe it's some nutritional deficits or um, a nutritional need um, that the embryo, the developing embryo has that's satisfied by these cravings. Or the sort of third explanation is there's something kind of reinforcing in the craved food, some sort of, you know, pharmacologically active ingredient that's activating or, or energizing and that causes cravings. In a nutshell, there's really no good evidence for any of these hypotheses that kind of implicate mostly biological factors. One of the most compelling things that I sort of cite to show that it's probably not physiology, and you kind of heard me point out that it, this is all specific to American men and women, cravings look very different in different cultures. Um, they tend to be a lot less frequent in other parts of the world. Um, the gender differences that we see in the U.S. are not nearly as pronounced in other parts of the world. Menstrual craving is not something that women in a lot of other countries report. Um, we've done a study more focused on the language side of things that shows that the word craving actually doesn't translate into a lot of languages outside of English. They looked at 25 different languages other than English. They interviewed native speakers and they found that the word cravings only exists in three of those languages, Albanian, Vietnamese and Spanish. I grew up in Germany speaking German. Uh, my parents are German. I talked to them in German. And so I found myself trying to tell them about my dissertation that was looking at perimenstrual chocolate craving. And I realized that German was one of the languages um, that doesn't actually have a word for craving. That is so surprised. I, this is fascinating to me. I feel like my life is one big craving. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. And again, it doesn't mean necessarily that people who live in those cultures don't experience cravings. I think it just speaks to sort of the importance and the meaning that we attribute to those experiences. So I always say growing up, I never heard a woman talk about craving chocolate perimenstrually or during their menstruation. That was something I didn't encounter until I moved to the U.S. So growing up, do you remember having cravings? No. And to this day, people always assume that I crave chocolate and I, I don't. <laughs> I love this because I think most people, including myself, would assume that it's just a human thing. It's really interesting to hear that it's very American. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Very American. So pregnancy cravings we do see in other cultures. Um, we've actually written on this, but the types of foods that women in other cultures report cra craving during pregnancy tend to be very different. Um, so they're often not the high calorie, high fat, sort of quote unquote forbidden foods, but they're more often the sort of traditional foods of that culture that have some sort of symbolic significance in terms of fertility or, you know, encouraging healthy growth in the child. So the types of foods that women crave during pregnancy also are very strongly influenced by culture. She says American women tend to report more cravings than American men. We think the reason why we see so many cravings during menstruation and pregnancy is because there's also these kind of cultural and societal notions of when it's acceptable for women to indulge in foods that are maybe otherwise forbidden. And pregnancy certainly seems to be a time where women are almost sort of encouraged or pressured to eat for two, or really go crazy with their cravings, and that that might be why women are more likely to report cravings at that time. And then, of course, we are constantly being marketed to. American advertisements tell us what to crave. They tell us we need a big, juicy burger right now. Just saying that makes me want to have a big, juicy burger. And women are always told that they need chocolate if they had a bad day. And Dr. Hormis says a lot of pregnant women gain too much weight because they think that being pregnant is an excuse to fully indulge their cravings, to eat as much or as unhealthfully as they want. It's that whole eating for two thing that we've been told is OK. So her research included techniques for helping people to overcome cravings. So how do you fight against a craving? I think everybody pregnant or not wants to know how to get this out of their brain. Yeah. If we take that forbidden element out of it, we sort of avoid that elaboration of those thoughts, obsessing, ruminating over it. So I always tell people, you know, if you are somebody who craves chocolate, have a piece of really high quality chocolate every day, really savor it, enjoy it and move on with your life as opposed to trying to stay away from it for days and weeks and then ending up kind of overeating and eating the whole bar. Um, so that's kind of the, the guideline in a nutshell. So we really try to teach women um, skills that come more from the mindfulness kind of acceptance based tradition, you know, realizing that thoughts about chocolate are just that they're just thoughts, you don't necessarily need to act on them. Recently, 
I have gotten into a bad habit of keeping chocolate near my bed. Like it's on my bedside table. It's mm. like I have my lotion, I have my lamp, I got my book, mm-hmm. and then I have this like big freaking hunk of chocolate. <laughs> and it's a fun fact that I did not share with Dr. Hormis because I don't think eating in your bed is eating mindfully. I love eating in my bed. It's one of my favorite hobbies. Back to William Shatner. He has a show on Aura TV called Brown Bag Wine Tasting. In Brown Bag Wine Tasting, I have gone out with a brown bag under my arm, a bottle of wine, and solicited anybody that I could find, uh, mostly just people. Got a couple of guys working on the road, so we set up an interview. He, taste this wine, and tell me what the wine tastes like in terms of traffic. Or I had a great musician bring his clarinet, taste the wine, and play me music that would tell me what you thought of this wine, that kind of thing. What kind of wine do you think would go best with avocado toast? A very bright French Chardonnay. What kind of wine do you think would go best with paintball? Uh, The red wine that is sold for $5 a bottle. What kind of wine do you think MILFs want to drink? Champagne. (laughs) Ding, ding, ding. (laughs) All answers are correct. (laughs) And that was William Shatner's Last Meal. Thanks to Anayansi Reyes, co-owner of Sushi Nola in Kent, Washington. They have live music every weekend, either mariachi or norteño bands, which is native to the Sinaloa region. Go get your fill of music and big, fat, deep-fried Mexican sushi. I love mariachi. I was watching your face. I knew something was exciting. That is very exciting. I'm going. Okay, go. Bye. Bye. And special thanks to Dr. Julia Hormis, professor of psychology at the Albany State University of New York. Don't tell her that I eat chocolate in my bed. This episode was produced by Laura Scott and me, recorded by Aaron Mason. Original theme music by Prom Queen. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal. Called Brown Bag Wine. Wine tasting. <laughs> Brown Bag Wine. <laughs> he loves wine. So the Spanish word for avocado is aguacate. 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 <laughs>